Okay, so today we're going to talk about the upper arm. Actually, the entire arm. We're talking about the upper limb. So we're going to start with the shoulder girdle. That is the bones that make up the shoulder area. There are two bones that kind of act like a bucket handle almost. I've used that term before with the ribs. But in this case, it's also appropriate because these two bones allow this arm to raise up like that. Allow us to flex our shoulder upward. Then the bone of the upper arm, which allows our arm to do this circular rotation. The two bones of the forearm. And then the three different types of bones that are in the hand. The hand we're not going to break into its individual components. Instead, we're going to look at the bones of the wrist, the bones of the main palm area, part of the hand, and then the finger bones, which are these are the carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges, respectively. Okay, let's start out by looking at the collarbone. This is actually called the clavicle. The clavicle, of which you have one on each side, so we're going to have to learn how to side this bone as well. This is this sort of S-curved shaped bone. You guys see this S-curve here? They're both shaped like that, although this one has broken ends at either end, so I'm really going to concentrate more on this one, even though this one doesn't go with this particular arm that we're going to be looking at. All right, so the clavicle. You're going to notice that it's got two pretty distinct ends. The sternal end, which goes toward the manubrium, it actually sits right in the manubrium or the sternum. The manubrium is part of the sternum. So this end is kind of rounded and it ends kind of in a teardrop shape. Now keep that in mind because we're going to use that to try to remember how to side this. The other end, so you're going to see this end is kind of rounded with this teardrop kind of dripping down. That's important. The other end you're going to see if I hold it horizontally, this end is much flatter. You guys see how much wider this end is than this one? And I'm holding this horizontally. Okay, that's our first clue as to which end is which. This is the acromial end. The acromial end goes with the acromion process on the, uh, the scapula, which we're going to meet later. So the flat end goes outward. It goes laterally toward the side that it's from. Okay, now here's the problem. If I know this end is in and this end is out, so this one goes toward the middle and this one goes out toward the end, how do I know that it's this side or this side? Because if I do it this way, still got the skinny side out and the wider side in. So I can still rotate it. We can also rotate it like that or like that. So this is where I'm going to get into some of my weird particulars and mnemonics on how to remember how to side these bones. These are a tough to side bone because it's so irregular in its shape. First step, figuring out lateral medial side. Great. Now we just have to figure out top, bottom, front, and back. So it's actually not as hard as it seems. But if you concentrate on this one, this is probably the hardest one we're going to have to side. And then once you get through this, you'll be able to side pretty much anything. Okay, so the first thing is figuring out top and bottom. Remember that teardrop I told you to pay attention to on the manubrial end? Look at that teardrop. You see how it swoops downward? If I was to hold this up the other way around, you're going to see it kind of skips way upward and it's virtually flat on top. Well, here's one of the cool things about the clavicle. You can feel your own. Your own clavicle runs right underneath your skin, right here. So you can feel it kind of go into this notch. This is called the jugular notch. You can feel that notch quite easily in between. So this end does not, it's relatively flat. If, when you feel your own, it's relatively flat across the top. Sure enough, do you see all these bumps on the one side and then the other side? Relatively smooth. Furthermore, it goes straight across. It doesn't dip down like that. We want the dip down or the drip to go downward. 
So you do that and you feel all this rugosity underneath here. These are all attachment points for muscle. Those all go down. The nice smooth side goes up. Fine. So now we know top to bottom and we know medial lateral. We still have to know which way is front and which way is back, right? Because this could be like this or like that. We can't do this anymore. We've narrowed those down, but we know this or that. So how do we do it? Well, this is where we use this S curve to our advantage. Do you see how it curves one way and then curves the other way? I want you to use that to your advantage. If you feel your own shoulder, you can, you can feel this almost this ball that is your shoulder. You can feel where it notches in right in front of the ball of the shoulder then it comes back out. Well, that notch in is what I want you to pay more attention to. I've got another weird mnemonic that I'll use in a minute, but first, feel your own collarbone. Put your fingers on the front of the collarbone, right where it dips in before the, and then feel it kind of swoops outward and comes straight across. What you're feeling, this dip inward, is actually this side. And then it comes out toward the middle, and meets up with the sternum. So what you're feeling is this way. Here's that notch in where my shoulder goes. See my thumb sitting right into that clavicle? Then I can feel it. I can feel it on my own. It's back in here, comes forward and across. Back in here, comes forward and across. You guys see that? It's really important to figure that out. Now we can side this bone. Which side is this? It's a left, left clavicle. So the other way, the weird mnemonic that I have to remember this by is think about shooting a rifle. When you're shooting a rifle, you wanna put the butt of that gun into that little notch, that little area here. You wanna set it in there. What I'm setting it into is that notch right there. As it sits on my body, there you go. So this is the right clavicle. This is the left clavicle. Ba boom. Easy peasy. So remember those three things. You want smooth part on top, squished end out to the side, teardrop end dripping down, and then lastly, you want this rearward swoop out to the shoulder where your shoulder sinks in right before it comes back out right there so use your own body your body is a walking moving anatomy chart use that it's important <laughs>
chromium process, coracoid process. I'll talk a little bit about why those are named that way and what those names mean in a few minutes, at least some of them. This inward dip is important to keep in mind. You're going to notice this has a very distinctive very convex and concave surface. The concave surface goes up against the rib cage. Think of it this way. You've got an exposed rib cage back here, right? Half of your rib cage. This wouldn't be able to slide along the rib cage, would it, with all these sticky out spiny bits. This would get caught up in between ribs. This, on the other hand, can smoothly flow over all those separate ribs. That's what it does. It goes against your back. And you can feel it kind of cups your own shoulder quite well. All right, now we've got two ends to it. This side and this side. So the deep triangle goes downward with all this stuff up top. The shoulder obviously goes lateral, right? The shoulder goes out to my shoulder. It couldn't be this way. That wouldn't make any sense, would it? So keep that in mind when you're siding this. The easiest way to do it, of course, would be to put it up against your own back, but that's awfully hard to do. So if you have a friend around, put it up against their back. You can clearly see. The glenoid fossa goes laterally. The coracoid process. Interesting story about that, I'll tell you that in a minute, which may help you remember some of this stuff. And the acromion process. The coracoid process. Coracoid, not coronoid. We met the coronoid when we were looking at the jaw, if you remember. Our mandible has a coronoid process. That is a process that goes right in front of the mandibular condyle. The coronoid goes along with the coronal say, uh, area, just right along this. The coracoid with a C, or I should say two C's, is because if you look at that closely, let me see if I can get it in focus here. Somebody thought that looks like a bird head. You guys see that bird there? It's kind of like Eagle Rock. But they thought it looked like a bird hovering over your shoulder. In fact, coracoid is the Greek word for a raven. Now here's where it gets interesting. If you know anything about uh, um, Norse mythology, Odin has two ravens which sit on his shoulders. Probably not where this term came from, but it's a great way to remember it. So Odin has his ravens sitting on his shoulder. If you remember that this thing kind of looks like a bird beak, sitting on a shoulder, coracoid process. It's a jump. It's a, it's a leap, but I, I get where you're coming from. May help. The acromial process actually attaches up, going kind of the opposite direction, attaches up with the acromion process on the clavicle. So these two things kind of join up together and form part of the shoulder. I'm kind of exaggerating it by holding these together like this. It'd be a little different, but you get the idea. And that creates this shoulder girdle. So goes forward, the glenoid fossa, the coracoid process, and the, and the acromion process all go out laterally. The big, huge triangle points downward. So what do you have? A left. You guys see that? Left scapula. Okay. <laughs> As I mentioned before, the scapula makes up part of that ball and socket joint. The rest of the ball and socket joint is made up with the humerus bone. Humerus, which, believe it or not, 
actually gets its name. Well, actually, it's the other way around. The funny bone. If you guys ever hit your funny bone, it's on your on your elbow there. What that actually is is a bundle of nerves that live right in here in the olecranon fossa. It's a bundle of nerves in there. And if you hit them hard enough, your whole hand will go tingly. So that goes toward the back side. We'll talk about that in a minute. First thing that's most obvious. Again, we've got we've got to figure out how to side this by getting it right in three-dimensional space. Up and down are pretty easy. With the humerus, the bottom side looks kind of like Snoopy's fist. You guys see it? These little knuckles of the fist. We'll talk about what that is in a minute. And then on the top side, the, well, we're going to call it the proximal end. I guess it's an arm, so it can go all over the place. It has this very obvious head. It's this very rounded area. And that is the articular surface that goes with the glenoid fossa. Okay? Okay. Rounded end goes up and in. If you had this going the other way around, it'd be your buddy's arm, not yours. So the rounded end goes in toward your body. Okay? Which brings us to this end. The easy way to look at this is you see this kind of swoop. If you think about skis or a toboggan, depending on what part of the country you're originally from, you can see it's relatively flat and then curls kind of upward. That goes forward. This is the articular surface for the elbow. And the elbow only bends one direction. It bends to the front. It doesn't bend that way. So you can think of this as kind of starting the bend. Now there are a lot of other ways you can look at this and a lot of other details which we can pick out on the, on the humerus, which we'll talk about in a minute. Okay, so uh, let's quickly go over some of the features of the humerus that you should know. Um, and then... We will use those and some other things and then my own weird craziness to help you side the humerus. Okay, so let's start with the top. We've got the head of the humerus. Um, this is pretty easy to f figure out. Everything that's big and round is usually called a head or a capitate or a capitus, uh, which means head in Latin, um, in almost every case. The head of the humerus is very smooth and very round. We're going to see the other head of the femur later on when we do the leg. Then we've got these two big lumps. Do you guys see these lumps? We've got a small one and a much larger one. Those are the tubercles, the greater, meaning larger, tubercle, and the lesser tubercle. Now, some people call these tuberosities. I think they're insane. It's a tubercle. Um, don't worry too much if you see it written as tuberosity or tubercle. And it's pretty obvious what they're talking about. In between that, you see that groove there, this little line, this little, well, valley. And it actually continues down into the bone. That is called the intertubercular, or tubercular, depending on how you look at it, uh, groove or notch. Most people call it a groove, um, which is actually where the biceps muscle attaches. The biceps muscle actually goes all the way up and attaches to that old coracoid process right here. So, then moving down, you're going to see kind of a groove right here, a line right here. Do you guys see that line, that, that crest? This is called the deltoid tuberosity because what that is is where the deltoid muscle, which is that sort of, well, deltoid-shaped muscle attaches which allows you to lift your arm out this way. It's a shoulder muscle right here. Allows you to lift your arm outward to the side. And sure enough, if we look at the way this is designed, we'll see this deltoid tuberosity is out to the side, allowing you to raise that arm up, out to the side. Okay, so the greater, lesser tubercle of the humerus, deltoid tuberosity of the humerus, if you need to, you never have to say that. Then down here, we've got 
an epicondyle because it's up toward the top. It's above the condyle, which is the, uh, the uh, articular surface. So here is an epicondyle. Do you guys see this ridge coming down? That's actually an attachment point for a bunch of muscles in the forearm. That's where these muscles here, let me, let me roll up my sleeve for demo. That's where these separate muscles attach. So these outer muscles, you guys see these moving around here? Let's see if I can get them to go. There they are. These guys all attach actually beyond the elbow up here onto this guy. And then these muscles on the inside attach in here. These big scooping muscles, these guys attach right here. Now you're gonna notice there's a big one and this very slight ridge here. Well, think about what these muscles do. The more powerful of your forearm muscles, that's these guys, this big massive meat here is used for grabbing and flexing that. Now your extensor muscles are these guys out here, these little guys. But which do you use more power to do? Flexing those fingers and this wrist or straightening it out? Much more of flexion. So the larger muscle group is here. This whole muscle group goes up and attaches to this larger epicondyle. So that's the medial, meaning toward the body, epicondyle. So it would be here, where this medial epicondyle sits. The lateral epicondyle goes out to these littler extension muscles out here, these little guys. They're not nearly as large, nearly as powerful as these big old monsters in here. Does that make sense? So we've got the, now, now I'm warm. Got to have, got to have it even. Besides, this will help me point things out anyway. So we have these two epicondyles, and then we've got this sort of smooth area here. This is the articular surface for the elbow. It's where the radius and the ulna t attach. The first one, you see this little, little one here. It's, let me see if I can get it in focus here. You've got a rounded area here, a rounded area here, and then this notch down the middle. That's called a trochlea. Trochlea because they thought it looked kind of like a bobbin for thread. And that's the trochlea is is the Latin word for bobbin or um, I don't know, whatever else you call a bobbin. I'm not even sure what else to call it. Like a, a spool. Beside that, you see this big round area. See that? Now I mentioned, every time you see something big and round, think head, think capitis, capitate. That's the capitulum. Meaning the same thing. Meaning little head. So, the trochlea attaches to the ulna, and I'll show you that in a minute. The Top of the humor, I'm, I'm sorry, the radius attaches here on the humerus to this capitulum, this head of the humerus. Make sense? So how do you side a humerus? Pretty easy. First of all, top and bottom are relatively easy. You got Snoopy fist down at the bottom, round thing up top, the head goes toward the top. Hey, that's easy. The big rounded surface goes in medially to attach to the glenoid fossa of the scapula, okay? The trochlea, if this helps, go, I mean, as the tubercles go out. Then going down to the other end, we can see that trochlea, that end, it looks like a ski. It, it's kind of flat on the bottom and then it whoop, rotates forward. Last things last, this goes in this large Snoopy thumb. And it's a little Snoopy fist. Remember our Snoopy fist? Snoopy fist, the thumb, goes in toward the body because it's the medial epicondyle. So we've got another left. Okay, so we know top, bottom, 
front, back. I can give you one more hint for the back, but I'll do that after we meet the ulna, which will help a little bit. And let me just put it this way, it is this deep fossa. However, that can be problematic because there's also, the front has a small fossa as well, which can, or fossa as well, which can get confusing. But the deeper fossa goes back, but the easier way to do it is look at it like a ski. You see it going whoop, then that would work as a ski, this would not. Shkunk. Wouldn't work. So ski tips up, there you go. And you got front to back, now all you need is side to side, well this and this go in, boom. Done. Easy. Left. <laughs> Now let's meet the ulna. The ulna. First we have this bird beak looking end. You guys see that? It looks like a hungry little baby bird. And then this other end, which if you look close, looks like a Barbie high heel shoe. I'll talk about what these different things are, but that's probably the way I'm going to teach you guys how to recognize this bone and sight it. There are some other features that we'll talk about in this bone, which will clarify, but first things first. The ulna is relatively simple to side and figure out. The ulna, as mentioned before, attaches here to the radius and to the humerus. It sits beside the radius that makes up the forearm bones. It attaches right there on the trochlea of the humerus to allow it to bend like a hinge. It is in fact a hinge joint. So we'll talk a little bit about the ulna, some of the features of it, and how to recognize and then how to side. First things first, this bird beak end. You guys see this big piece that comes off the top of the bird beak? That, if you guys remember, we looked at the olecranon fossa in the humerus. The olecranon fossa, the olecranon of that ulna plugs right into the olecranon fossa. So in life, this goes right in there when you straighten your arm out. Let me get my hand out of the way and you can see what I'm talking about. Click, straight, bent. And this, the tip of the olecranon, is your elbow right there. You can see it. Feel it right under the skin. This then goes under, and right behind it is that nerve bundle that we talked about. There's your funny bone, which gets its name because the humerus, of course, sounds like humerus, although it's spelled differently. So, humerus aside, let's look at the ulna and look at some of the features of the ulna. Ulna's pretty easy. First of all, we've got that olecranon process. That's this part up here. Now's where it gets a little confusing because the bottom of the bird beak is again for an anatomical position and we bend our arms on anatomical position but still this is on our coronal plane so here is another coronoid process in this case they call it the coronoid process of the ulna bottom of the bird beak then we've got the shaft then, at the other end of the shaft, we have this rounded area here, which is the toe area of Barbie's shoe. And then we've got the high heel of Barbie's shoe. Now, that high heel is called a styloid process. Just like every time we see any long spit of bone sticking out, they call it a styloid process, named after a pen or pencil, a stylus. So, the styloid process is going to help us side this bone. There are a few things that are going to be, make this bone really easy to side, but the first one is using your own arm. Very important. So if we take this, but, oh wait, let me let, tell you one other little bit. Is if you look at this bone lengthwise, I'm not sure if I can get it highlighted enough. Jeez. Do you guys see this ridge right here? That ridge is only on one side. This side is nice and round. It's kind of triangular shaped and cross-sectioned, 
But this ridge is telling. That is called an interosseous ridge. Now, every time you hear the word ossi, us, it means bone. There's an interosseous ridge on this. There's an interosseous ridge on the radius. They go together. And those ridges, sorry, I've been drinking a bunch of caffeine. Those ridges point toward each other in life because there's sort of connective tissue that runs in between there. So, nope, this is to the wrong side. That's annoying. That's why they don't line up perfectly. This is actually, this one's a left and this one's a right. So that's what's going on here. All right, so interosseous ridge, olecranon process, coronoid process of the ulna, styloid process, okay? So those are what we're gonna to use to side this. Very easy, very easy. First of all, does the bird beak go up or down? Well, when you saw it articulating with our humerus, it goes up to latch onto that humerus. You guys see that? So, very easily, this goes up. We know this end is toward the head in anatomical position. So this makes this proximal. This end is distal. Okay, easy peasy. Now, something to write down, take down, put into your head. Don't let it out of your head ever. The ulna goes with the pinky. Ulna goes with the pinky. Radius goes with the thumb. Keep that in mind. Ulna goes with the pinky. Radius, I don't know where the... Is it over here? It is over here. All right. Only goes with the pinky. That'll save us a lot of time in the future. Only goes with the pinky. Radius goes with the thumb. Here's what I'm talking about. How do I do this? Well, I take this, put it with the beak side going up. Sorry, my camera just died and then everything got all wonky. Let's do this. This. Okay. Starting all over again. So, Lay your forearm out, put the ulna with the beak side up, lay it on your arm like that. Now, that styloid process, which, which hand does the ulna go to, or which finger does the ulna go to? Finger goes, I'm sorry, the ulna goes with the pinky. Just remember that, the ulna goes with the pinky. So. You see how that styloid process, that's it right there. Get your bearings. Here's, here's Barbie's little Barbie shoe right here. Okay, there's her high heel. That high heel, the styloid process, should point to the pinky when you have it laying like this on your arm. So here's the styloid process. You guys see that? And it'll kick over to one side or the other when I put that beak up. Styloid process is kicked over to this side. You guys see how it's over here? It's not over here. It's over here. See it? Now, if I turn my hand in anatomical position, lay the beak going up. Where's that styloid process? It's over to this side. You guys see it? Is that pointing at my pinky? No, it's pointing like more toward my middle finger. So, I do this though. Look at that. Pointing right at my pinky. You guys see it? So this goes on the pinky side of my arm, and you see that little styloid process and point right toward my pinky. Conversely, the radius. Radius has a bunch of different pieces too. We'll talk about that in a sec. Okay, now let's talk about the radius. Now, <laughs> a lot of these features on the radius, I'm not even gonna make you do. Because a lot of the features on the radius are exactly the same names as features on the ulna, same names as features that we found throughout. For example, the ulna, the coronoid process. That doesn't help us much, unless we say the coronoid process of the ulna, and then it gets confusing. Meanwhile, there is a head of the ulna and a styloid process of the ulna. Well, guess what? On the radius, 
There's a head of the radius, which is on the opposite end, by the way. And then there's a styloid process of the radius. There is an interosseous crest of the radius as well as of the ulna. Okay, so <laughs> this is how we're going to do it. It's a lot easier. There's also, do you guys see this big knob here? It looks like, looks like somebody wadded some, some bubble gum and stuck it on there. You guys see that little extra wad up top there? This is called the radial tuberosity, and what that actually connects to, believe it or not, is your biceps muscle. It helps you rotate your arm. It helps you pull your arm up. It's actually attached at the long end to there. So the, your biceps actually goes from your radius all the way up, skips your entire humerus. Most people don't know this, but the biceps isn't attached to your humerus at all. It goes through the humerus, around it, over it, and attaches here at the scapula, the biceps muscle. So the radial tuberosity, which you can see there, the little knob. Let's start at the top. We have this kind of, they call it a lozenge shape. I don't know if you can see that, but it's a very circular thing. It looks kind of like a breath mint or a cough drop. And then it's got this dip in the middle, or if you're really biologically oriented, it looks kind of like a red blood cell. So it's got this very rounded edge. That's because the radius does just what its name implies. It rotates. Now, Unfortunately, I've got the wrong side radius for the wrong side. But you can imagine these two sides articulate and it rotates and folds up over the ulna. Your ulna does not rotate much. Your ulna's right here. It's locked in. Remember, it goes with the pinky. Watch my thumb. Pinky virtually stays still. Actually, it really lines up right here on the ring finger. But look at me rotate my hand. Look at my ring finger. And then look at my thumb. Really, I could do it like this. Look at my pinky. Look at my thumb. So the rotation is taking place this way laterally with the thumb. If the ulna goes with the pinky, the radius goes with the thumb. So close up, we put that lozenge. That lozenge, by the way, locks right onto that Capitulum of the humerus and rotates. That's what goes in that little dent. So it also has an interosseous crest going down the edge, ridge. Can you see that? Going down the inside. It's got a very rounded outside edge, just like the ulna. Has this lozenge shape, this big bump, radial tuberosity, the head. And then going down here, we've got this styloid process. But if you ask me, Kind of looks like a kind of a hand like that. I know it's a stretch, but that'll help you guys. When we are trying to side this, you'll see, you'll see. So how do we side this? Well, first of all, I want you guys to look right here. Do you guys see, let me see if I can get this, the light. Do you guys see these little ridges, these little bumps right on this back side? On this side, it doesn't have them. On this side, it's totally smooth. This side, we got all these ridges and lumps and bumps. Do you guys see them? They look like knuckles. Hey, here's my wrist side. Here's my knuckle side. That's cool. The other thing I told you is the styloid process. Well, that styloid process, if the styloid process of the ulna pointed at the pinky, styloid process of the radius, where's it going to point? Thumb. Boom. So all you have to do, it's very easy. You know the lozenge end goes, plugs into the elbow. You know, because it's associated with the biceps, which is on the front of the arm, you know the radial tuberosity is going to point upward. See that? And then the styloid process is going to point at the thumb. I'll tell you the rest of the thing, too. Knuckles on the back, go with the knuckles in the hand. Styloid process going with the thumb. Let me see if I can show you guys this. Knuckles back, wrist up, 
Radial tuberosity, relatively up. Kind of goes in, too, a little bit. And there we go. And the last thing is that interosseous crest is going to point toward the ulna. The ulna's interosseous crest is going to point out toward the radius. So make sure that they point at each other when they're in there. But if you do the knuckles, thumb, and lozenge, can't go wrong. You cannot go wrong. Knuckles down, just like your knuckles are going down. Don't do it like this. Do it like that. Right? Every time you're trying to line anything up on your body and use it as an anatomical model, thumbs out and down, unless you're doing the forearm thing, then you can do the thumbs up, which sometimes helps. I mean, elbows up. Okay, that's it. So now we know how to side the clavicle, side the scapula, humerus, ulna, radius. Easy peasy. Now we're going to talk about the hand. Luckily, the hand, you're not going to have to side because we're not going to break each little individual bone of the hand up. Instead, we're going to show you the whole hand. All you have to do is tell us what types of bones they are, and it's very easy. <laughs> Alright, let me start by showing you guys. This is my articulated hand. It's just held together with uh, fishing line. But, very simple. All we're going to do is break down the different types of bone that we have in the hand. Now, the first type is very simple. It's these eight bones right here. You see those small cube-shaped bones? Sure enough, these are called short bones, if you guys remember from 101. These small, kind of cube, kind of weird shaped bones. There are eight of them, and they each have a name, but we're not going to go into that too much. I just want you to pay attention to how small and kind of cube, or yeah, you can think of it as used chewing gum shape. They're small, they're kind of odd shapes. There's eight of them. And they make up the wrist bones, also known as the carpal bones. Carpal tunnel is a tunnel created really by the pisiform, if I can get it into its right position. Why is this not cooperating? Eh, forget it. This, is, it, this uh, fishing line isn't holding it in good enough position for me to do it with. Okay, the next bones that we're going to look at are these rays here, these, these kind of long, thin bones. These make up this part of your palm area. It's kind of make up the non-articulating or non-moving part of your hand, this sort of base of your hand, the palm of your hand. These are called the, if these are the carpals, these are on top of them, so we call them metacarpals, metacarpals or outside of them, I guess. And of course, there's five of them because these are the bases for the last set of bones, which are the bones of the fingers and the bones of the toes, by the way. They're named the same thing because they're virtually identical. These are called the phalanges. Now, not to say that bones of fingers and bones of toes are in fact identical. You can differentiate them, but we're not going that deep in this. The phalanges, and in each one of the fingers, <laughs> there we go, there are three, oh, I can make it bend there backwards, stop it, there are three phalanges, except in the thumb. The thumb, there are only two. Same with the big toe. Thumb only has Two areas of articulation, so I've got the base and the end can articulate. Fingers, I have the base, the middle, and the end. Three. Two segments, three segments. One, two, three. Make sense? Phalanges. You guys, that's it for the hand. The hand is the easiest thing to side because, quite obviously, 
long as you have up and down and everything else lined up, which in this one it's too flim flimsy, I can't possibly show you that, but essentially in this one we have a right hand. But that's neither here nor there. We're not going to ask you to side the hand because we don't have one that is halfway decent. Maybe in the images we'll be able to do one. You can see the curvature of the hand. Hand only bends one way. It doesn't bend that way. It flexes. Yeah, I'm sorry. It flexes and it extends. That's it. All right. So we met the clavicle, the scapula, the humerus, the radius and ulna, and the hand carpals, metacarpals, and the phalanges of the hand or the upper limb. And that's it for the bones of the upper limb. Guess what? There's two sets, right? We're relatively symmetrical. So if you have a right arm, you're going to have a left arm. And you guys probably already figured that out. That's why we side these things. All right?